something happen to you and you can't wait to tell someone you know who has had a similar experience? Have you ever been so eager to share what happened to you with someone who has shared the same thing with you? It feels great. It feels great because we are being heard with the heart, truly heard by someone who knows what it is like, someone who has had the same thing happen to them. It's one of the reasons we gather in like groups, women, men, transgenders, youth, children, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists. It is why lifelong friendships are formed in support groups for people who have experienced the loss of a loved one, for people with cancer, for people who struggle with addictions. When we share with each other something the other can understand because they have already lived through it, we are comforted. We are not alone, and we are strengthened. My youngest child left for college, and now I am an empty nester. A friend replies, oh, when my youngest left the nest, I cried for days. Things just did not seem right. But now I have adjusted, and it's OK. How are you? coping. We feel relief that though our struggle may still loom large before us, someone else has gone through it and lived through it and is here to help us as we go through it. This is one of the many ways Jesus can help us in our lives because he experienced some of the things that happened to us. He was a small and vulnerable baby, born in a stable amidst barnyard animals because his parents were not given rooms with the people. How often have we felt rejected, perhaps like a second-class citizen? Jesus' life on this earth started that way. Jesus' parents celebrated Jewish festivals. They had friends. They had relatives. They lived in a small town. What ordinary human experiences these are. Religion. Relationships. Small town life. We know about community, church, and friends, and family life. And Jesus knows about them too. And so God gave to this earth God's beloved son, Jesus. Imagine this. Imagine loving a species, us, so much, yet being removed in a way that prevents you from actually knowing by experience the pain and suffering joy and gladness, the heartaches, the triumphs, the life events, and all that goes with living and breathing flesh. Imagine wanting so much to be available for us that God sacrificed that which is beloved to God. God gave us Jesus so that Jesus could have the experiences of being human. Jesus experienced humanity firsthand so that God could know us better. This is the good news, that God so loved the world that God gave God's Son so that we might have abundant life through him. We are heading toward that abundant, eternal life but there is so much that Jesus can offer us on the way, on our journey. Our everyday lives can be made deeper and more meaningful, knowing that Jesus walked the path of humanity just as we are walking it. 
Sometimes it can be frustrating not to know more about the life of Jesus between his birth and his death. In the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, maybe a tenth of his life is recorded. What was he like as a toddler? We aren't told. Did he celebrate birthdays like we do? We don't know. Did his parents tell and retell the story of his birth, highlighting the donkey ride, the majesty of the magi, the appearance of the shepherds? I hope so, but we don't know. But perhaps the mystery itself is a gift. Not knowing a lot about Jesus' life gives us the freedom to imagine that Jesus had some of the same kinds of human experiences that we have. True, he was not disappointed because he did not receive the latest technological marvel for his birthday. He wasn't angry because a Mack truck cut him off on the freeway. He wasn't relieved because Wegmans stocked the key ingredient for his casserole. But we do know he had experienced disappointment, anger, and happiness. They are part of being human. Because of this, we can identify with him and he with us. In the last four weeks of this Advent season, we have remembered the emotions of others associated with Jesus' birth, the trepidation and the joy with which Mary accepted her role as his mother. The responsibility Joseph shouldered by marrying his betrothed, even though she was pregnant. The challenge of raising the Son of God. Imagine. And in today's reading, we can begin to think of the physical, human, emotional Jesus as he grew. We are told his family celebrated the Passover every year and that in Jesus' 12th year they traveled to Jerusalem. There with a crowd of neighbors and family members and friends and loved ones. They celebrate Passover and then on their way home they can't find Jesus. They lost him. Where is he? I thought he was with you. He's not with me. I thought he was with you. Mary and Joseph have been entrusted with this awesome responsibility and they have blown it. I can't imagine what that must have felt like. But the gospel writer tells us Mary was anxious, agitated, nervous, and tense. Because we are not given much information about Jesus' life, we might not think about what happened between his birth and the beginning of his ministry. We sing carols about how shepherds and magi came to visit and adore this newborn child, and then we sing Lift High the Cross to mark the other end of his earthly life. But this passage today is the only time in the Gospels that we hear about what it was like for Jesus and his family between his birth and adulthood. There are other stories about Jesus in other books, some of them ancient texts, some of them contemporary fiction. But the only story that made it into our Bible is this one. From it, we can take away a little bit about what it was like for Jesus and his parents. As parents, we can identify with the responsibility of raising a child, the challenges and the surprises and the joys that come with it. As children, we can identify with the preteen asserting independence. On that day when Jesus was supposed to have left Jerusalem with his parents, he made up his own mind about where he would be, and he chose the temple. He chose his father, capital F, God. And yet when his father Joseph came to bring him back to Nazareth, 
Our scripture tells us that Jesus was obedient to his parents. Through choosing God, his divine parent, Jesus learned to respect and obey his human parents. What can we learn from this? Go to God to make our human relationships stronger. Here he was, Jesus, Son of God, yet walking among humans. And God taught him to obey the laws of the earth. Do as your parents tell you. They know how it is to be human, and you are learning. The last line of this morning's scripture says, Jesus increased in wisdom as he grew. He was learning the humanity of life like we all have to do, and it isn't always easy for any of us. He was figuring out the balance between the human and the divine. Jesus was found in the temple learning what was being taught about God. He was listening. He was asking questions. Finally known as an upcoming man in the Jewish faith. He was earning respect with his questions. Questions that the rabbis may not have thought of or been asked before. And I wonder if he was asking them to better understand how to minister to those in the Jewish faith. Did he know what he would need to know to initiate change? Or was he surprised by the ways he would later challenge the authorities, both religious and secular? We are not told, so we speculate. We know from the Gospel of John that God gave this world Jesus Christ so that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. We have our example of eternal life right here in Jesus, right here in one who was so like us that he was born of a human, grew into a young man, one so like us that he asked challenging questions and asserted his independence. And yet one so unlike us that he was recognized by shepherds, wise men, and a man named Simeon. Simeon, who had waited his entire life to see the Messiah. Simeon's story comes in Luke's gospel just before our passage this morning. Simeon had been assured by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he had seen God's Messiah. He does. When Mary and Joseph bring the baby Jesus to be presented for purification at the temple. Anna, a priestess of 84 years, and Simeon are both holy. They pray constantly and are spirit-led. In this purified state, each of them recognizes Jesus as holy. By their works, Anna and Simeon have achieved an inner divine state that allows them to see more fully, and they know who Jesus is. They have achieved the inner spiritual peace that comes with deep and prayerful connection with God, a connection that humans can achieve with work, faith, and trust in God. My friends, it is entirely and absolutely worth the work and the patience to become fully spiritual as we see in the reactions of these two elders and how they embrace the Son of God. We put our trust in God, we work and pray in God's name, and then our eyes are opened widely and deeply in ways we might never have imagined possible. And we see Jesus here among us 
Anna and Simeon saw Jesus in the temple, and where do we see him? In the streets, with those our society considers lowly. Think of the ways in which Jesus might be in those you consider less than. Those of us with hearts open to hold a thousand hardships, still we can open them a little wider, go just a little deeper to find the places we need to grow a little more in our acceptance of others. It is a lifelong process for us as it was for Anna and Simeon with an awesome ending, fullness in God. Living in fullness with God is indeed a lifelong process. Jesus in his humanity is with us as we grow and deepen spiritually, living abundant lives in him. It is in Jesus that we have a lifelong friend and guide who knows what it's like for us. Amen.